This is episode 99 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. This and every week we'll be talking to you about public policy issues facing New Mexico. This week I am pleased to be joined by Myron Ebel, Director of the Center for Energy and the Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute based in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Tipping Point, New Mexico, Myron. Thanks for having me, Paul. Yeah, uh, well, there's always a lot to talk about with energy and issues in that area, especially being here in New Mexico. Uh, Of course, Myron, we go back a long ways to my days at the National Taxpayers Union, and you've been at Competitive Enterprise Institute for uh, quite a long time. Uh, Talk briefly about what CEI, as it's known, is, and kind of your growing into that role and being there for uh, a number of years now. Uh, CEI was founded in 1984 by Fred Smith, um, uh, a disillusioned uh, or an enlightened liberal from Louisiana who discovered that uh, the regulatory state was uh, not the solution but the problem to our environmental problems. And uh, he thought that the free market and libertarian movement in general uh, back in the 80s was good on taxes. It's easy to be good on taxes. We're against them. We want lower taxes. It's fairly easy to be good on spending. We want less government spending. Well, it's not that easy, but it's it's easier than regulation. But regulation was something that free market groups at the time were not paying enough attention to and that our political debate wasn't paying enough attention to. So CEI has always specialized on in regulatory issues, in red tape, uh, not, not just environment and energy, but also financial services, labor, antitrust, trade. Uh, if it's a regulation, CEI has probably done something on it. Uh, but our two biggest programs over the years uh, uh, were our uh, first, uh, for a long time, it was our property rights and federal lands uh, uh, program, which uh, became kind of one of the leaders on Endangered Species Act reform, uh, which, of course, we never had up until uh, the last few months. We're now looking forward to a little bit of it. Um, and uh, and uh, other property rights issues. And since the late 90s, CEI has most, uh, our biggest and most, I think, most successful program has been on uh, energy and climate. And uh, we've been, I think, the, the leading organization in Washington, D.C. on on the global warming issue and, and all the energy issues connected to it. No doubt. And uh, there's plenty to talk about in, in those areas. But before I move on, I have to uh, give a shout out because you had a, uh, a, a start at the National Taxpayers Union, so we have have that in common, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, indeed. Excellent. Uh, well, before again, before we talk about some of the specific energy issues uh, uh, that CEI deals with, uh, you worked uh, in the early days of the Trump administration helping with the uh, transition team, specifically as I recall, on energy issues or something directly relating to that particular area of policy. Can you talk about both the area that you engaged with him on and what that experience was like? Uh, Because I think from a free market perspective, uh, most would agree that that has been one of the most coherent and successful areas of the Trump administration. But talk about, you know, what it's like to be on a transition team and what you actually did. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I was uh, asked to join the Trump transition uh, soon after it was uh, got off the ground in August of 2016. That is when the campaign was still going on. There was a Trump transition and a Clinton transition. Uh, uh, I was asked to be to lead the uh, uh, Trump transition team for the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and some related issues with some other smaller agencies. And so... Um, Starting in sep- early September of, of 2016, I put together a team of people with different kinds of expertise who were all committed to the Trump agenda on energy and climate and environment. Uh, and uh, we worked through until Inauguration Day on January 20th, 2017, when 
when other people came in and took over uh, and actually had official positions in the federal government. I, I was not one of them. I'm, I've never really wanted to work for the federal government and uh, or in the federal government, and so I didn't want to join the Trump administration, but I was happy to work to try to get it started in the right direction. Now, what did we do? Well, uh, uh, candidate Trump uh, didn't have a big policy apparatus, unlike most campaigns. He didn't have a bunch of com uh, blue ribbon committees that wrote white papers that sort of laid out a long list of things. <coughs> Uh, but he did give a number of speeches on policy, and he made a number of promises. Uh, and he made uh, something like 42 or 43 big promises on energy, climate, and environment. Uh, quite a few of them were EPA-related. Uh, and so the purpose of the transition was to take these bare-bones promises, which didn't have white papers and lots of research behind them, and figure out how to implement them once President Trump was elected and took office. And so we worked from September until January 20th, 2017, and at that point the the, uh, the administration took over and our job was done. Uh, it, was, uh, it was exciting, it was in some ways frustrating, um, but the key point that uh, the, the transition made, and I think you see this in President Trump's uh, presidency, is uh, we want the transition to figure out how to keep and implement every one of the promises the candidate has made on the campaign trail. And some of these uh, haven't been kept because they require Congress to pass something, and Congress has been very uh, slow to pass things. But of the things that he's uh, promised that can be done administratively through changes in the way the federal government is organized or uh, through through executive orders, President Trump, at least on energy and the environment, has has kept uh, now or is in the process of keeping virtually every one of his campaign promises. So it's it makes him kind of unusual as a as a candidate who gets elected. Uh, you know, most of them try to forget the things they promised as quickly as they can. Now, uh, did that involve meetings with the president? Um, how much or little did you interact with President Trump? during that process? Uh, not at all. His, uh, the transition was located here in the uh, GAO building in, uh, uh, or no, not the GAO building. Anyway, uh, a big government building near the White House. <laughs> and uh, uh, I There's can't plenty of those. Undisclosed yeah, location, yeah, well, I think we'll call it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big, big building. We had a, a lot of office space. We had several hundred people working. My team had, I don't know, 50 people on it. Um, and Tres President Trump uh, uh, did his entire transition at a higher level at Trump Tower or in New Jersey, uh, at his wh wherever he lives down there. Uh, and so he never actually visited the transition headquarters. I actually saw him for the first time on June 1st, 2017, when he gave a speech in the Rose Garden, and he invited me and a lot of other people who were involved in it uh, to come and listen to his speech in which he kept his campaign promise to get us out of the Paris Climate Treaty. Uh, and I actually sat in the second row, and uh, uh, he was right there. So I, 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 that's the only time I've ever seen him in person. Got it. Well, that's interesting just from a, a logistical perspective. But uh, one thing more about the president and you know this presidency, we can talk about policies uh, uh, shortly, but what in President Trump or why do you think he – has been so focused and ultimately so good on energy policy. Nothing in his, as far as I've seen, his background, you know, being on television, being in real estate and in New York City, which um, you can certainly talk about the energy policies of New York uh, are, are not very good. Uh, they're far worse than most states because they're fracking ban. But um, what do you think has caused President Trump to be so engaged and so uh, good on this issue? Paul, that's a very interesting question, and I, I'm sure I don't have uh, the whole answer, but I think, first of all, he's not a typical New York City elite. You know, he's not a lawyer or a stockbroker or a banker. He's, he's a builder, he's a developer. Uh, so he actually, in the course of his career, uh, had a lot of practical experiences with the federal and state and local rules and regulations 
that hold up and and uh, and sometimes kill projects. Uh, for example, the wetlands rules. He's he has a lot of experience of those. So I think that's the first part. The second part is he really likes people uh, who who uh, work with their hands, who build stuff or make stuff or dig up stuff for a living. And I I, I didn't pay much attention to the campaign. I, I in living here so long in Washington D.C., I've become somewhat jaded and cynical about campaigns, so I don't actually pay a whole lot of attention to them. But, uh, you know, he didn't do – his campaign was different from other professional politicians who have a, a set of uh, overnight polls and uh, 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 talking points on a card, and they go from one event to another, and they try to do a whole bunch of events in one day, flying or, or driving from one to the other. He did these big rallies. Well, one of the things I learned about these rallies is not only – did he get thousands of people to come to them? But after the rallies were over, he didn't just go off, fly off to his next event. That was his only event for the day. He would actually spend hours uh, afterwards uh, in the back room behind the behind the stage talking to people. And I think one of the things he discovered is that his personal experience of how projects to build things are delayed by environmental uh, regulations, that this was actually holding up the entire country. And then then he found out about the energy uh, renaissance that shale, the shale revolution has given us and that what, a, what an opportunity this was and how it was happening, but that the Obama administration was doing whatever they could think of to try to, to, try to stymie it and slow it down. And so he, he talked to people and he discovered that we have you know, the world's greatest energy resources in coal, oil, and natural gas. And uh, a lot more could be done with them, both economically but also politically, in terms of our our trade balance. Our, uh, you know, we don't import all this oil, and also our geostrategically, in terms of uh, our our influence in the world by being becoming the world's energy superpower. So, I think uh, th I think that's part of the story. I don't think I've given you the whole story, but I think uh, those are two um, uh, key elements in in his. Uh, why he came to see energy, what he called, came to call energy dominance as a key part of his economic revival agenda. And uh, kind of related to that, uh, your organization's known for one of its big reports annually, and I know you're not maybe directly as involved in this, but uh, you do the 10,000 Commandments annual report on federal regulations. And that's also been a strong area of the Trump administration. Um, can you talk a little bit about regulations and, you know, obviously a lot of them are environmental regulations, but some of them are not environmental regulations and both CEIs work on those, but also uh, how the president has tackled some of those head on. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think, you know, really uh, president Trump actually was influenced by some of the work that my colleague Wayne Cruz has done on uh, the regulatory state or the administrative state. Uh, and I think he was influenced by some of the work we've done on, on uh, 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 climate and energy policy. Uh, you know, I said he made all these campaign promises and he's trying to keep all of them. Um, one was we're going to get rid of two regulations for every one new regulation that we have. I think so far they're way ahead of that. I think it's like 10 or 12 to one, but of course, you have to say, well, some of these regulations are bigger than others, and maybe this won't last. Maybe they'll start doing a lot more regulating as they go along. All that's true. But I think, uh, you know, he said we're, we're going to get rid, on, in my field, we're going to get rid of the constraints on energy production, and we're going to get rid of the constraints on energy use. Because the fact is, not only is the United States the world's energy superpower now, but we also that all that energy that we're producing from coal, oil, and natural gas is giving us a huge price advantage, a cost advantage, in terms of per making things, manufacturing. Uh, we we have the lowest price electricity in the world. Not in California, maybe not in New Mexico for long, given what you're doing uh, uh, politically. But in states like Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, they have very cheap electricity and that's why manufacturing is now flowing back into this country after after flowing out for 20 or 30 years so i think so far in the trump years there's been a net plus in manufacturing jobs now of over 400,000 
uh, after after years and years or decades of decline. So manufacturing is coming back because manufacturing takes energy, and we have the cheapest energy in the world. So as I said, uh, President Trump as a candidate discovered that the whole energy, uh, uh, all the energy issues were very connected to his plans and hopes to get the economy going again. And you see it, I was just out in Ohio. Uh, Ohio has been stagnant or declining most of it for years and years and years, uh, predates Obama. Uh, there's a new spirit of hope there because the economy there is now actually growing faster than it is in New York or California. Yeah, no, well, as a uh, former Ohio and current New Mexican, uh, I can assure you, yes, that uh, the state of Ohio has seen some nice uh, improvement economically, especially the eastern part of the state, the Appalachian area mm-hmm. of Ohio. Now, New Mexico, uh, we remain a energy bastion, and you know we're sitting on huge supplies uh, out of the Permian Basin, and we're the third lar- largest producing state in the country. But economically, overall, New Mexico remains far poorer uh, as a state. So, you know, kind of transitioning to what you're working on now, uh, what issues, you know, given all of the preponderance of energy and the back and forth uh, with the Democrats kind of coming out very hard anti-energy, what is uh, what is your day uh, today uh, energy issue that you're looking at the most or what suite of issues do you really think are the most important these days? Well, let me begin with two that aren't uh, uh, directly related to energy, but are directly related to uh, your economy in New Mexico. Uh, One is uh, the Endangered Species Act has been, uh, it hasn't done much for endangered wildlife, but it has done a whole lot in terms of establishing federal land use controls on people who own land all across the country, including large parts of New Mexico. And, uh, you know, it's, it's proved, uh, I, I've been working on the Endangered Species Act reform since the late 1980s, and we, we thought we had a chance in the mid-90s after the Republicans took control of Congress, but Newt Gingrich stymied those efforts because Newt Gingrich likes, likes I don't know, he, he thinks the Endangered Species Act is a great thing. Um, but, uh, you know, nothing's ever happened. Uh, and now the Interior Department under Secretary David Bernhardt uh, is actually uh, moving ahead with uh, with uh, changes in the rules. They're not they can't change the law, but they can change and improve the rules implementing the Endangered Species Act. So that's something that's coming to a head now uh, in the next month or so with the final rule being published. Uh, the other thing is wetlands. The wa- the waters of the U.S. rule. I, I think uh, you know you could. The wetlands program, uh, the federal wetlands program, was out of control. It was far too broad, even before the Obama administration. But with the uh, waters of the U.S. rule, they were asserting jurisdiction over, uh, as you know, uh, large parts of the desert southwest, which were now suddenly going to be uh, jurisdictional wetlands because uh, every few years a flood might come down a, a gully or a canyon, and now that's a wetland. So they're trying to uh, reform the the WOTUS rule, or well, they've repealed the WOTUS rule, and they're now trying to reform the wetland rule. And I think that's very important for rural America. I think it's very important for the energy industry, and I think the changes in the Endangered Species Act that they're uh, the rules that they're proposing could also really help the energy industry as well as the the livestock industry in New Mexico. No doubt about it. Um, so you know, on the federal front, of course. Federal lands are a huge issue here in New Mexico, and that's one that at least to date hasn't been um, carried out in the same way as a lot of uh, conservative advocates and free market folks would like to see a little more uh, in the way of land reform, BLM, National Forest Service lands, uh, something done to address uh, just the bureaucratic red tape, but also everything from you know, the ownership of those lands and what is done with them. Uh, Any thoughts on lands as an issue and specifically uh, what the Trump administration would like to do or can they actually do it? (laughs) Uh, Well, those are hard questions. 
you know, the federal lands are a huge uh, problem as well as in some ways a huge benefit for the Western states that have a lot of federal land. Uh, the problem I see is, as I grew up in the Intermountain West and my family still has a, a little bit of uh, ranching property in, in eastern Oregon, uh, and I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, with the, some, some, I have some familiarity, familiarity with the New Mexico uh, livestock industry. Uh, the problem is that the, there's been these policies emanating out of Washington, which are not based on what's good for the land and what's good for the people who live there, but it's based on uh, what I would call urban eco-imperialism, that the people who live in the big population centers uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast somehow know better how those lands should be managed than the people who live there. And the consequence of that is uh, we have now several decades, and it, it, it accelerated during the Clinton administration in the 90s and the Obama administration uh, from 2009 to, to 17, uh, to lock up the lands. Let's, uh, we don't need to have resource production on the lands. They're there to look at. They're not there to use. They're not there to produce things that we need. They're not there to benefit the people who live there. Uh, and I think this is a huge problem. It's, it's not going to be uh, solved, uh, especially since Congress won't cooperate. Uh, it's not going to be solved uh, in, a, in a few years. But I think the Trump, uh, in Interior Department and the Forest Service are really starting to make some progress in improving uh, the conditions of federal lands, and also uh, trying to reestablish resource production, and that's uh, mining, oil and gas production, livestock grazing, and timber production. I guess those are the four four main categories. Uh, and, and I think you know they're making some progress. That we're starting to cut a few trees now again in the national forests. Not many, but it's it's a long way to go to get back to to uh, 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 kind of, of, of uh, steady state production that we had back uh, 30 years ago. Uh, now, as, as you know, and you've seen it in New Mexico, and I've certainly seen it in my area in eastern Oregon, because they've stopped uh, logging, stopped timber production on the federal lands, we're now burning up our national forests instead of, uh, of using them. And of course, this has terrible consequences for the environment, terrible consequences for wildlife, in some cases, endangered species, uh, and so uh, it's a long. It's going to be a long road back, but I think they're starting to make some progress on on uh, really on all fronts. Some of it is already. I think you can see it already in, in some areas. Some areas are much slower, but they're but they're really trying. They really do believe that uh, rural people in the West, uh, uh, you know, uh, value the land and they they're better managers of it than the federal government is. No doubt about it. And I guess this would be a good time to mention that you are coming to New Mexico. Now you're coming to uh, the Rio Doso area to speak to the cattle growers uh, organization. Uh, what are you going to be talking about with them? And, uh, you know, I know they're a group that at least has some interest in land reform as well. But um, talk, talk to me about what you're coming to New Mexico to share. Well, uh, I'm going to be on a panel to talk about who represents the agriculture industry, uh, and I'm going to talk about who represents it in Washington, D.C., and perhaps make some uh, comments on how well they're doing and uh, uh, what, what the problems are what, what the problems are facing uh, the New Mexico cattle growers uh, in dealing with uh, the federal government, the land agencies, and the Congress, uh, and whether the organizations, the national organizations uh, that represent them can, can be, um, uh, you know, where they're doing a good job and where they're not doing such a good job. I do think I'd, I'd go back and say one problem, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, why do we have all these federal lands and well, can't we get rid of some of them? I think that's one area that the Trump administration is not going to touch. I think they're going to say... Well, Federal lands we have, we're, we're just going to try to manage them better. We're going to try to manage them better for uh, environmentally and also for the people who live uh, in in the federal land state. So um, that's that's I, I'm I'm all I think we should be devolving uh, federal lands, uh, not the national parks, but the BLM land and some of the national forests to the states and to the counties, and maybe eventually privatize some of them. I I, I don't want to get in too much trouble. For saying that, but I think uh, that's the direction we need to go. 
I think the Trump administration isn't going to get us there. Uh, but I think uh, they, they are moving in the right direction on management. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. But of course, the next administration probably will go the opposite direction because it seems like all of the political pressure is on locking up more land, uh, stricter use of those lands. And certainly the Democrats, holy cow, they're uh, uh, just extremely uh, ambitious in their environmental plans, whereas uh, Republicans often are willing to fall into line. Trump, to his credit, in many many cases has taken unpopular stands uh, in favor of uh, good policy, but uh, certainly Zinke, the former interior secretary, wasn't uh, ready to go down uh, a controversial path on lands. That doesn't mean the environmentalists didn't uh, take him to task and criticize <laughs> him nonetheless. But uh, if Trump is not willing to take on the ever encroaching federal estate, it seems unlikely that other politicians are willing to go there. But uh, that'll be an interesting presentation. And uh, is that open to the public there, the cattle growers, or is that focused no, strictly on? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. No, it's you got to be a cat, a member of the Cattle Growers Association. Got it. So, <laughs> well, so um, I, I've uh, I, I've been lucky to be in New Mexico several times in the last few years. So, uh, I spoke to the Independent Petroleum Association of New Mexico's annual meeting last summer, and so this summer I'm doing the cattle growers. So I'm. Uh, I'm uh, very always very happy to be in New Mexico. You have a you have a lot of political problems, but as you know, you have a lot of um, well, it's a magical state. So yeah, I love being there. Exactly. Thank you, Myron. And uh, you know, we've got a few minutes left, but um, you know, the, the Green New Deal, uh, whether it's New Mexico's <laughs> alleged Green New Deal with the uh, clean power not clean power plan, but the uh, shift to a hundred percent. Zero carbon electricity, fifty percent renewables by twenty thirty forty uh, by twenty forty. P and M says they're going to be a hundred percent zero carbon, uh, but of course, on Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has her federal uh, Green New Deal, which quite frankly has caught in a lot more caught a lot more attention and plaudits from especially the media than I really thought it would, based on how poorly it was rolled out and just kind of uh, crazy and unfocused it really was. But, uh, you know, I'll let you pick and choose where you want to go with <laughs> with those because, of course, in, in these areas, there are so many uh, topics to choose from and policies are flying all over the place, including here in New Mexico. Yes. Uh, well, of course, Australia just had an election on this over the weekend on whether they should continue with their pro-energy agenda of the conservative government, the liberals and the national parties, uh, or whether they should um, go the Green New Deal route and start doing a lot on climate and, and trying to start locking up their vast reserves of coal and uh, gas. And, uh, you know, su they surprised everybody by voting uh, to, to stay with the pro-energy agenda. And I think um, it's odd that a place like New Mexico, which gets so much of its revenue from oil and gas and so much of its employment, uh, could uh, pass this kind of um, uh, local Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal resolution here in, in uh, that Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez introduced, um, is... Uh, it's a fantasy. It won't work. I, I think that what's driving these things is people who don't know where stuff comes from. Uh, they think that you can take the energy sector where we get all of our electricity and all of our transportation fuel and, and completely uh, turn it upside down and transform it in a few years when, in fact, um, you know, it takes it's taken a uh, hundred it's taken more than a hundred years to build it up to what it is today. You can't you can't dismantle it and replace it with windmills and solar panels in a few years. And even if you could, it wouldn't work. Uh, the electric grid uh, won't work with just wind power and solar power. It it will collapse. Um, you can't get all of your uh, of our transportation sector on electric car batteries and and uh, uh, you know, winding up rubber bands. Um, 
there there's just uh, the whole thing is is from people who who live in big cities and just have forgotten or have never understood where stuff comes from the the amount of stuff that you have to dig up to build all of these windmills these tens of thousands of windmills and millions of solar panels uh, there, there is just isn't enough mining capacity in the world to dig up that stuff. It would take decades to build up enough capacity to dig up all that stuff. So, the the fact that you passed this legislation and you you're all uh, your your political establishment is now proud that you're going 100% renewable energy, it's a fantasy. It will it will progressively impoverish you, and you will I, I hope you will very quickly realize it's just practically impossible, materially impossible to do this. So uh, here in Washington, we're having fun with the Green New Deal, but you actually have to live with the consequences of what you've enacted. No doubt about it. And it is a, a, a very disturbing piece of legislation. Of course, it's called the Energy Transition Act. It passed as SB 489 in the 2019 New Mexico legislature. We've talked about it quite extensively in, uh, on this podcast and with a number of other experts. And uh, most of them concur with you that it will never be actually implemented as written simply because it's impossible to get to where they want to go with the Green, uh, well, with the Energy Transition Act, with what some are calling New Mexico's Green New Deal. But uh, you, you think the... Uh, what do you think about the the national green new deal obviously it's just as unachievable and unattainable but uh it seems to me again that a lot of people have rallied around this idea and that uh you know it, the conservatives and free market folks are often uh accused of not coming up with alternatives well the alternative is to let people do what they do and buy what they buy without telling them, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. <laughs> but uh, what do you, what are you guys saying about the green new deal and the issues that it raises, whether it's uh, just policy issues or just the uh, complete devastation of our way of life and economy that it would uh, foist on us? Yes. Well, I think, you know, what you passed in New Mexico, I think, I hope you will very quickly find out that it's it's starting to raise your electric rates a lot. And maybe, maybe you know, sanity will return to your, to your politics. Here in Washington, the Green New Deal, uh, as you say, it's attracted a lot of support, uh, but it's by people who haven't bothered to read it. And I would, you know, you can go on the web and read it. It's, it's HR1. Uh, see if I got this right, H.R. 109. Uh, there's a Senate bill, too, but I'll just leave you with one number. You can Google it and find it on congress.gov, H.R. 109. Well, you know, it, it's crazy. Uh, it's preposterous. It's, uh, it's physically impossible. It would totally collapse the economy. It would require uh, command and control policies and an authoritarian government to tell people uh, what they could and could not do. Uh, it it it's not going to happen. But on the other hand, all six Senate Democrats who are running for president have uh, signed on as co-sponsors of it. So we've got this weird, well, you know, Washington runs on appearances and a lot of appearances are fantasy. So I guess that's what's happening. I think you, you put your finger on it, Paul, when you said Republicans are accused that they don't have an alternative, but that the alternative is letting the free market work. Another way of putting it is the the alternative is the Trump energy agenda, which is to let the free market work. Um, I think the the problem we face is not the Green New Deal. I think that actually provides opportunities. It's very easy to ridicule. It's very easy to tell people, explain to people how much it's going to cost. Your your electric rates, I think, by one, uh, one study that's already been done, your electric rates per family would go up in New Mexico about $4,000 a year. Uh, and, you know, New Mexico's a poor state. $4,000 may not be a lot for somebody who lives on the Upper East Side of Manhattan but uh, or in Montgomery County in, in, in Maryland here in the D.C. suburbs, but $4,000 a year, uh, you know, plot that out and see, see how you like it. Um, I think the problem is that we have a number of Republicans in Congress who think that they have to have an alternative 
And so they're talking about things like carbon taxes, that is taxes on burning coal, oil, and natural gas, where we get 80% of our energy. Um, and they're also talking about uh, renewing and extending the tax credits for windmills, solar panels, electric cars, and things like that. So in other words, wasting taxpayers' money and, and, and benefiting special interests. So uh, those are the kinds of things that, that uh, many Republicans in Congress, I think, are uh, who can't think very clearly are, are, uh, are coming up with, and I hope we can those, – th- those are going to be the real battles. The Green New Deal is, is, is never going anywhere, but these Republican – we have to have a reasonable, moderate solution to climate change. Well, in fact, it, you know, as you know, none of these policies will do anything about climate change, uh, but uh, uh, those are the things that are going to have some political um, – uh, 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 possibilities behind them that they might actually start moving in Congress. So I think the big fight is is going to be in that kind of mushy middle. No doubt about it. Well, um, last question, uh, and hopefully it doesn't put you on the spot, but you know, you're not a uh, CEI is not a uh, a Trump uh, oriented organization. They do not seek offense for Donald Trump. Uh, you have on your website a thing about uh, Trump. Remo- removing most steel and aluminum tariffs. So your organization is free market uh, in the area of regulation, in the area of the environment. Trump has been pretty darn good. In the area of free trade, he has not. Yeah. But I'm going to bring right. this back to uh, kind of the area of expertise and something that we've been looking at. Uh, and actually, there were accomplishments of the Obama administration in many ways, crude oil exports and liquefied natural gas exports. Uh, uh, It's been interesting to watch how that's evolved, both as the market has come, you know, to life for uh, crude exports, but also liquefied natural gas uh, facilities are coming online. Can you share any information you have about how you see the trade war impacting these issues? Just kind of whatever you you've that's come across your desk or whatever you've read and done on that, that issue. Yes. Thank you, Paul. I, I thank you for mentioning that we're not a Trump uh, supporting organization. We're nonpartisan and we, we support certain policies. And if the people in office support them, then we support those policies and where, where they don't support them, we, then we oppose them. So yes, we have a lot of opposition to uh, president Trump's uh, trade policy, some of his trade policies, maybe not, all of them. Uh, We are free trade. I think the big obstacle to oil and gas exports and also to coal exports is the lack of infrastructure to get these things to port and get them out on ships to the countries that want them. And uh, of course, you know, we have in this country a a, a, a large industry that does nothing but build pipelines, for example, and builds coal shipping terminals and LNG uh, uh, facilities for, for liquefied natural gas. The problem is we're facing more and more uh, 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 governors and states that are saying, no, we're not going to allow that because it presents too many environmental risks to our citizens. So on the West Coast, uh, we've got California, Oregon, and Washington all saying no to coal terminals and all saying no to um, to LNG terminals. We're trying to. Now, the coal terminal issue is very important because, of course, Wyoming and Montana have these vast reserves of coal. They have more coal there than anywhere else in the world. And if they can't ship it and and get it out to uh, from from Oregon or Washington, they're stuck. So uh, this is a huge issue. I think the pipeline issue now, you've, I'm sure you've uh, uh, been talking about the fact that the governor of New York has blocked uh, uh, two, two natural gas pipelines now, I think. Uh, and, and, and New York is have, facing a shortage of natural gas. Uh, how are people going to heat their homes if they can't get enough natural gas? Well, I guess we can ship in some LNG from Russia, and that will be the solution. So I think, I think the infrastructure problem has now gotten, uh, 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 has been made much more complicated and, and difficult by the politics of by these grandstanding governors like uh, uh, Cuomo and, uh, and uh, Governor Brown in Oregon and Governor Inslee in Washington, who are just saying, nope, nope, we're not going to allow another state to ship its product through our state. And I think you're seeing 
you have a little less of a problem in New Mexico, but I think you're seeing the same uh, uh, lack of pipeline capacity for the Permian, and it's going to take a while to to uh, fight these battles, I think. Yeah, and uh, I actually just had an opinion piece in the uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, current Argus. There's a Carlsbad, New Mexico. Didn't write it there, yeah, but it talked about yeah. uh, uh, the New Mexico congressional delegation, which, of course, is not just Democrat, but extreme partisan left-wing Democrat. And they've been participating and talking about uh, you know, the pipeline issue and, and limiting pipelines out of the Permian Basin. And it's just, uh, it's not only contrary to New Mexico's you know, well-being economically, it's ultimately harmful to the environment because this venting and flaring issue that has is so uh, right. captured the left is uh, exacerbated when you don't have the pipelines to ship it out. But, uh, you know, if you're pretty hardcore environmentalist, it seems to me uh, hard to believe that you would lump, literally, I guess, lump coal and natural gas into the same uh, basket there. Natural gas is is very, very clean, and coal is, is a less clean fuel. I mean, it, do you share that? viewpoint and uh, question why there's this uh, desire among some in the environmental community and politicians to uh, make that equivalence? Or do you see, you know, that we should defend coal and natural gas equally uh, as we move forward? I think we need to, uh, I defend them on different grounds uh, somewhat. I mean, we get 80% of our total energy globally and in the United States from coal, oil, and natural gas. Each one has advantages. Oil, obviously, is uh, what we use for transportation, and coal and uh, natural gas are what we use for electricity. Uh, I think, uh, yes, coal. when you burn coal in an in a, uh, old-fashioned um, uh, coal-fired power plant, it's dirty. I think a modern one uh, is very clean, uh, and I think... Um, so I, I, I think the pollution issue is is somewhat – I think the natural gas people tend to exaggerate how dirty coal is. Yeah, it's it's dirty if you bring it home and put it in your fireplace, <laughs> but it's not dirty in a new – in a modern uh, uh, power plant with all the scrubbers and all the technology. Uh, and both – I think both fuels have advantages. Uh, obviously, coal is great for baseload power, uh, and it, you can stockpile – uh, reserves of coal at the plant, so it, you can't have dis, dis, de, uh, disruptions through, you know, uh, something goes wrong. I think natural gas is great because it, you can turn it on and off. Uh, you, it's a natural, it's a turbine. It's very similar to a jet engine turbine, except bigger, uh, and well, and more complicated. But uh, you know, a turbine you can you can ramp up and ramp down fairly easily. And so, if you're if we're going to have societies that have more wind and solar power, which you know, you, the wind stops blowing and the sun goes down every night. Uh, you're going to have to have a lot of natural gas. And the idea that you can't have pipelines uh, in places like New York City, they've already got thousands of miles of pipelines. If they saw a map, they it would, you know, they'd, they'd realize that, that, that every time they go out the door, they're walking over a pipeline. Uh, and yet we can't have a new pipeline because somehow that would be, uh, you know, the the environmental catastrophe of the millennium. Uh, so, uh, they, you know, I think reality will set in at some point when people uh, can't get natural gas in the, in the Northeast and New England and New York. They're going to say, hey, wait a minute, this is crazy. There's a huge amount of natural gas just just over on the other side of the the uh, Appalachians there. Um, and, you know, why aren't we piping it in and using it? So I, I think, um, you know, I think reality uh, eventually is going to help us win some of these battles. But there is a, there's a lot of craziness going on now that we can't have one new pipeline somehow. That will be, you know, the end of the world. Yeah, that is, uh, that is really crazy. And, uh, well, maybe Trump can go run for governor of New York or something and set them all straight up there when he gets done <laughs> in the White House. So. All right. Well, uh, Myron, uh, how do folks find out about you and your efforts there at CEI before we wrap up? We have a website called CEI.org, and we have a blog on that website called Open Market. Uh, so you go to CEI.org, and you'll see uh, all the issues that we work on and all the people who are working on them. And uh, 
Um, uh, so that's that's the main portal to CEI. Nice, and I see your uh, annual dinner is right around the corner. And uh, I have to say that if uh, people listening don't think libertarians or conservatives know how to party, uh, the CEI party uh, or annual dinner is always a, a very fun time. So if you're in Washington you. on June twentieth, I mean, yeah, maybe this isn't uh, much of a uh, maybe this doesn't sound so great, but I mean. In terms of the dull dinners that uh, go on in Washington, ours is, I think, right at the top in terms of being fun and enjoyable. So, all right. If well, you're in town in June 20th, uh, Paul, you're you're uh, you're invited. Uh, Paul, you know, uh, you mentioned CEI. I just want to say to you that I think you and your foundation do great work. It's been wonderful working with you over the years. I think you're uh, an essential, a really important part of the policy debate in New Mexico. And uh, I, I just hope everybody who, who listens to you is supporting your work and, uh, and paying attention to it. Thanks, Myron. And uh, thanks for listening to this week's pod, uh, podcast discussion. We're working every day to turn New Mexico around. Go to Rio Grande Foundation. Dot org for more information or to support our work.